when I got a letter printed in Silver Surfer number five, I got 500 letters from guys all over the country who wanted to meet a girl who read comics. Because there were only three of those in the world <laughs> at that time. <laughs> There must be some sort of weird sensation doing that. That final issue has been sent off to the printer. Mm. This is true. We feel a sense of accomplishment like you can't imagine. Um, we feel some wistfulness. The one thing we don't feel is sad because we set out to do a thing and we did it. And we were able, by a little bit of manipulation of timing, working with Dark Horse to have the final issue come out 40 years to the very day from the first appearance of Fantasy Quarterly Number 1 in 1978. So that felt great. Mm. The legacy of the series is wide-ranging. Do you see the impact that you guys had directly in the books on the shelves and with the creators that you, you know, converse with and, and hang out with at conventions? Well, your question covers it. Um, when a creator comes up to us, you know, someone who's really gotten well known in the business, and they say, yours was the first comic I ever read, or you were the one that got me excited about getting into this business, sometimes we almost can't believe it because of who comes up to us. And um, to know that years ago when they were quite young, they, they got started with ElfQuest of all comics, is um, it's really amazing or if, an, if a, an artist tells me that my inking style inspired them and they practiced inking by copying my work and then went on to their own style it's almost like uh, being a mentor without really knowing it we uh, we never had kids of our own but as wendy just said these wonderful talented people come up to us and say essentially you and elfquest got me started in this business and so we sort of feel like we have a lot of kids all the same mm -hmm. out there. They just weren't <laughs> biological. <laughs> I would imagine you hear from female creators a lot. Yes. Because you were a rarity back then. Yes. There were a few female artists and writers and editors, but it was still a primarily a men's uh, field. I would imagine you hear from a lot of female creators that you inspired them because you showed them the way into the business. Um, if, if I did, it was indirectly but I think they felt more comfortable giving it a try knowing someone had been there and I communicate a lot um, online and and before that we've done a lot of interviews that I'm sure a lot of young women artists had a chance to read and say well if she can do it I can do it so yeah and we continue to hear from women artists to this day it's wonderful the world of ElfQuest is so Intricate. Uh, the world building you guys have done over the past four decades has been immense. And it's funny, uh, a friend of mine who's, who's a deep, deep <laughs> ElfQuest fan said there's stuff in the role playing game that didn't show up in the comics until years later. Did you guys lay out this whole universe well ahead of time, thinking, okay, in a few years we'll do this, or down the road I might, you know, unravel this little story strand? How did that work? The thing about ElfQuest is that we knew from day one how it must end. We didn't know how long it might take us to reach that conclusion, but we knew where we had to get to. When you know that and you're telling a story, you can take side trips all over the place if, for example, a character cries out for a little bit more attention, a little stage time. Uh, you can give it to that character. Um, aspects of the world, areas of the world that we didn't really think about ahead of time but that the characters took us to, we were able to flesh out. Because all the while, we still knew where we had to end up. So, no, we didn't have a complete encyclopedia of the whole thing at day one, but we were able to develop that going along, knowing how consistent we had to stay to be truthful to the ending. Before we even got to know about Joseph Campbell, uh, we, uh, we thought in terms of circles. We knew that we wanted the hero's journey of Cutter, the chief of the Wolf Riders, to come full circle. He had a mission, and we wanted to, however, however long it took, we wanted to bring him through that mission and to complete it, and he did. 
the book was also unique in that it was like a gateway drug for a lot of young <laughs> comics. <fans. laughs> it really was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Despite the fact that some of the themes may have not been considered kid-friendly. Right. But you did what a lot of great books have done, which is not try to talk down yes. to the audience. And these universal themes really attracted uh, a new group of, of readers. And you did what nowadays is, is like the white whale, the, the unicorn of the comic book industry. <laughs> you attracted young readers. Well, one of our most favorite kinds of feedback is when we get a letter or an email or a comment on Facebook or social media from a younger reader. And they tell us essentially, thank you for not talking down mm -hmm. to me. Thank you for telling me the truth because I'm now able to put that into my own life. I'm able to mm -hmm. take that in. And I didn't know that was possible before I read your words and saw your pictures. Kids who feel marginalized, who feel bullied, who feel like they don't fit in and don't belong, especially, especially when they're entering adolescence, identify with our characters because our characters represent any group that feels marginalized or pressured by society to conform and they, they won't. Uh, the elves represent otherness and so kids who just feel like they don't fit in anywhere find themselves in the elves and they let us know about this. They let us know that it's a, it's a healing experience for them to find characters that know they exist. Mm. Where did the idea for, for Elf Quest first come from? <laughs> I've been drawing elves since I was two years old. Really? Yes. Literally, literally. <laughs> we have drawings that she did when she was two and they are recognizably you kept elves. Yeah, point of years. Yes. Point of uh, years thanks to him. He, Where was this fascination from? Well, just like the kids who find themselves in Elf Quest, I found myself in fairy tales and folklore uh, from ancient times. And um, when I think of elves, uh, even far back when I was a very young child, I identified with them. I, I sort of felt like a changeling. I was adopted, uh, and to this day we don't know who my birth parents are. And so, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a feeling of otherness of my own. And um, all the stories that I've ever told, even before we actually got to ElfQuest, mm -hmm. have reflected a search for family, a search for roots, a search for tribe, a search for identity, because that's kind of what I've been about all my life. What a lot of the great stories come from, the the creator's personal yes. story. Yes. And as she just said, she has had this story inside her all her life. 1977, Star Wars happened, and the whole world suddenly was okay with science fiction and fantasy. Whereas before Star Wars, it was that crazy Buck Rogers stuff, and mm -hmm. only geeks and social maladapts would read it. Suddenly, it was okay to like fantasy and science fiction, and that told us maybe it was time for us to take our own shot yeah. and put her story out there. We had been comics fans for a while. We were Marvel fans, and we enjoyed the Fantastic Four and all the work of Jack Kirby. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> he was like my... Um, my indirect mentor, you know, he, he, was, he was my sensei. In, in what way? Because that, you, I'm not going to let you just say that and not go into detail. He was one of yeah. two, the yin and yang senseis. Well, I'll start with Jack. He, w he was like my western sensei. From Jack's art style, I learned, it, you see, because it's unusual for girls to draw uh, a heavy, bulky structure. Girls tend to be more into line work, and so was I when I was uh, uh, in my late teens. I met Jack when I was about 19 years old, and uh, he looked through my portfolio and he said, if I ever catch you working in comics, I'm going to spank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so years later, when we had been in comics for a long time, and you know we would share a, a table in Artist Alley with Jack or something like that, I would say, Jack, I'm still waiting for my spanking. <laughs> And he would blush because he's just like Ben Grimm. He was the thing. <laughs> so, but Jack was my unwitting mentor because he taught me structure. He taught me how to do an action scene. He taught me how to, how to be kind of fearless in giving characters bulk and weight. Um, my other mem mentor was Osamu Tezuka. 
wow. who is considered to be the Walt Disney of Japan. And uh, he taught me the line of beauty. He taught me beauty and grace uh, in uh, doing the layouts of a comic book page and being very inventive with layouts and inking and experimenting with different textures. And ElfQuest has been considered the first American manga because of that Japanese influence. What was it like sharing a table with Jack Kirby at a comic convention? <laughs> uh, can I tell you a story? Please. All right. So we're sharing a corner. I'm, I'm here, and Jack is here, right? And he's got his line of fans, and we've got ours. And a fan brings me a bouquet of flowers, carnations, right? So I'm looking over at Jack, and he's busy. Now, Jack was a very focused person. He could just focus his attention and be completely unaware of anything else that was going on around him. So I took a carnation, <laughs> and while he was talking to a fan, I stuck the carnation behind his ear, <laughs> and Jack didn't notice. And so How did I notice that? He, I, he was so focused on what he was doing, he didn't feel <laughs> this flower being put behind his ear. So he continued to talk with this Carmen Miranda carnation poking out, and, and everybody was like... The, the fans were all chuckling and giggling, and, and he couldn't figure out why they were giggling. And one of them said, Jack, <laughs> and he felt, and he pulled, he pulled the flower out, and he turned to me and goes, I'll kill you! <laughs> he was, you know, cigar and all, he was just like Ben Grimm. Now I'm picturing what a, what a, a Jack Kirby ElfQuest cover would look like. <laughs> well, when you see my trolls, my trolls are a tribute to Jack Kirby, especially the feet. I think you guys co-write the series and, and plot it out. We co-plot and then in the car, right? You, 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 oh yeah. You, you guys plot out your stories on long car rides. Is that, is that correct? Long Wendy, car rides. Wendy oh. has had the whole <laughs> skeleton with her for the long time, and she will lay out each segment. But then we will go on long car rides to nowhere and have hours-long conversations and come up with the most wonderful, amazing stuff. See, when you have the the basic skeleton of the story. You can hang all kinds of ornaments on it. You can take lots of side trips and create new characters. Somehow or other, we ended up with 700 characters. And uh, <laughs> you got a deal, you know, because the fans want to know. That's about 2.3 two <laughs> over the 300 issues that you did, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the fans want to know. You know, the fans are amazing. They just are interested in the tiniest detail about the tiniest background character. They want to know who that is and what their life has been like. So we try to address that over the years. And, um, you know, over over a pizza, we'll, we'll, you know, try to get this all organized and see if, who we can give the spotlight in, in the ongoing story, knowing that we have to stick to the main storyline, which is the hero's journey. Sure. You know, whatever else happens in the story to decorate it, we've got to keep that through line going. And um, that helped us stay focused. That's why even when we took side trips, the story didn't meander off into odd territory. During all the time that you were working on ElfQuest, I imagine you had offers to do other projects. Oh, sure. Sure. Give me a few titles and characters that you were offered oh, to well, work on that you said, thanks, but no thanks, I'm busy. Well, uh, I didn't usually say no. <laughs> <laughs> Other, when ElfQuest got big, when ElfQuest was, was uh, well noticed, uh, people that we know in the business would come to her and say, hey, we're working on this project, would you like to be in on it? Mm -hmm. And because, A, we knew these people, and B, it would probably be interesting. You did some well, there were fun things. There was a fun crossover with, the, was it Valiant? Uh, uh, yes, ElfQuest appeared in an issue of Harbinger. Oh, oh yes, yes. Yeah, we did. And she did the artwork for the second issue of Kamiko's Johnny Quest. Johnny Quest. She's been a longtime fan of Johnny Quest. And I did two graphic novels based on the Ron Perlman uh, show Beauty and the Beast back in the late 80s. Oh, with Linda Hamilton. Oh, Linda Hamilton. yeah. And, oh, was and, that fun? And we're very proud of those, even though I didn't really have anything to do with it, because if you were a fan of that series, the third season wasn't so great. Mm -hmm. And in her second graphic novel, she got to give the Linda Hamilton character the send-off, the goodbye, that we think all the fans would really have liked. Yeah, I've been to several Beauty and the Beast conventions, and the fans have let me know that they appreciated that while the third season kind of left them 
hanging, the closure that's in the graphic novel really helped. <laughs> I love the fact that you guys met as pen pals in the Marvel Comics Letters column. Yes. 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 That is a great story. <laughs> I don't, I can't say for sure, but I think we had to be one of the first to do that. It happens a lot now. Yes. Because communication is so much easier. Because it's via email, it's electronic, it's much easier. Back then, it was writing on a letter and back then, to the editor, hope, hope it got printed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hoping it got printed. That's right. And back then, they didn't hesitate to publish your address. So when I got a letter printed in Silver Surfer number five, I got 500 letters from guys all over the country who wanted to meet a girl who read comics. Because there were only three of those in the world <laughs> at that time. It was very rare back then in the late 60s. And uh, out of all those letters, this one stood out. Because out of all those letters, he said, I really liked what you had to say. But if you want to know more about me, you've got to write me, and I promise you, surprises await. <laughs> he was very, very Sly clever. dog here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was scared out of my mind anyway. I was one of those 500 that said, oh, this is a great letter, and oh, it's by a girl. And... Remember your first phone call? Oh. Remember? <laughs> How many letters before you, 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 you did you guys exchange before you spoke on the phone? Uh, there weren't many. Mm, not there many. weren't many. There was a chemistry in uh, her response to my letter was to send me a piece of her artwork. Yeah. Oh. And my mind exploded. Do you still have it? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. right, um, it was the character Triton, one of Jack Kirby's creations. Mm -hmm. The Inhuman. And, mm -hmm. The Inhuman. And I thought it was the most amazing non published in a mainstream comic book piece of art I had ever seen. So I think we exchanged just a few letters and then I gambled on a phone call and... I know and it was his first phone call and I didn't know his voice so I said, Tom? Jim? Alfred? Uh, you know, because I knew all these guys from fandom. <laughs> she was in. <laughs> she was in comics fandom. I didn't even know comics fandom existed. So I called up and said, "Hi, guess who this is?" <laughs> and she proceeded to rattle off a litany of guys that she already knew. And I was sinking lower and lower in the phone booth seat. And finally, we got that straightened out, and look, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> Thanks to Silver Surfer. Number, Number five. five. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Stan and John, because that was Stan and John Buscema. Big John Buscema. And yes. Stan told the story in his Rolling Stone interview years ago, so he he knows what happened. That is incredible. <laughs> yeah. So Elf Quest has come to an end, but has it truly come to an end, or would you be open down the road to even having other creators continue? You are reading our minds. Final Quest number 24 is the conclusion of this 40-year arc, this 40-year hero's journey. But there is a past to this world, there is a future to this world, and we have employed the talents of other writers and artists before. This arc may be over. ElfQuest is not done. And we are, right now, uh, exploring possibilities of using the talents of other people, writers and artists. We've already spoken with Dark Horse about it. They're interested. So ElfQuest will continue. And some of the artists and writers that we know have approached us and said, I hear you might be looking to have other people do stories for you and I'd really like to take a shot. So it's pretty amazing. This is, this is an exciting time for us yeah. to both keep our feet in the waters of ElfQuest and yet explore new possibilities working with different people. Do you have any particular projects that you want to tackle next? Years ago, in 2008, I did a graphic novel based on Edgar Allan Poe's short story, Mask of the Red Death. It's a horror story. And I happen to be a horror fan. <laughs> and so uh, I was very excited to do that. Now, Poe's story was only eight pages long, but I did a 400-page graphic novel and created all new characters for it. Out of the script for the graphic novel, I wrote the book and lyrics for a Broadway-style musical. And I found a marvelous young composer named Gregory Neighbors, and we've been working on it. And uh, we're getting to, ready to do our third re uh, staged reading of the musical this year. Wow. Yeah. That is incredible. And completely different. Oh, oh totally. Than what I thought you were going to tell me. No. <laughs> if, if, if ElfQuest represents 
her light side, mm. not light fluffy, but light spiritual, then Mask of the Red Death is her shadow side. Mm. And what did you say? How did you phrase it? You had to do something after years and years of ElfQuest to let the the shadow out. Oh, sure, because ElfQuest is we like to call it a work of light. The, the characters are not superheroes, they're not goody goodies, they just try to treat each other as well as they can. And we always look for the positive direction to take the characters in ElfQuest, to, to leave a positive message behind. But in Mask of the Red Death, I really wanted to explore the dark side of human nature. <laughs> so this is rich people behaving very badly. It is the darkest dark chocolate. <laughs> you can, uh.